Hello and welcome to The Gaggle, where we challenge and, if necessary, destroy media narratives. I'm George Sanueli, and with me today is uh, Peter Lavelle, co-founder of The Gaggle and uh, host of Artie's talk show, Crosstalk. Um, the other day, um, the august publication uh, of the august Council of Foreign Relations. So foreign, kind. Exactly. <laughs> foreign Affairs magazine published a very long article uh, co-authored by four-star general Jim Mattis, uh, who uh, up until uh, 2018 was the uh, defense secretary in the Trump administration. As in the case of most uh, articles uh, in foreign affairs, it was long on words, long on uh, cliches, long on platitudes, and long on um, soothing uh, phrases such as international alliances and international partnerships. The gist of the article can actually be summarized uh, in very uh, simple terms. Uh, the United States must maintain its uh, presence everywhere and uh, it must uh, coerce its quote allies, uh, unquote, and its quote, partners, unquote, um, in order to get them to do what the United States wants. Um, what the goals are is uh, left, <laughs> left in this kind of vagueness and generality. Um, but what the, what the conclusion of it, and, which is, and, and this is what made this into a new story, is that no more America first. America alone is an absolutely terrible idea. Uh, what we want is partnerships. We want is alliances. Um, and then later on, we'll try and figure out alliances and partnerships uh, with a view to what. Um, what do you think of the article, Pete? I, I agree with everything you already said here. I mean, what, what makes the article so um, um, opaque is first of all, the national interest is never defined, number one. Um, um, it is off, uh, also implied uh, um, about these uh, friendships and alliances and all of these partnerships. Well, who's the senior partner? It's always the United States, okay? So you help pay for decisions I will make and you have all the downside, okay? So that's how this works, all right? Um, the, well, let me give you a, a, it's kind of a longish paragraph but, uh, or half a paragraph here, but this kind of sums it up and I think our viewers will really like it here or really dislike it as they should. Uh, this is this is Mattis um, writing, or, or allegedly, okay. To dismiss U.S. involvement today in Afghanistan, Iraq, and elsewhere as endless and forever wars, as both President Donald Trump and President-elect Joe Biden do, rather than as uh, support to friendly governments struggling to exert control over their own territory, misses that, the point. It is the United States' interest to build the capacity of such governments to deal with the threats that concern Americans. Really? Um, <laughs> it goes on to say uh, that, uh, that work isn't quick or linear, but it, it, is, uh, it, it is an investment in both greater security and stronger relationships. Uh, this is like a dating game, this article here, and preferable to the United States and definitely having to take care of threats on its own. Well, why are the countries um, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, and elsewhere mentioned here? How did they come destabilized? Right. <laughs> why? Why are the United? Why? Why did? Why is the United States there? It's never defined. See, this nothing is defined here. It just kind of in this this forever present moment here. For, for these people, there's no past. Oh, that was a long time ago. That was a long. It doesn't matter. It was a long time. Certainly, it does matter. Okay. You know, overthrowing the legal government in Iran in the 1950s still has consequences to this day. Right, okay, right. not just 9-11. Right, right. And so this is this, this nonsense. I mean, it, it, I, I wrote to you, it's just batshit crazy stuff here. Okay. I think it's a, that is right. Um, and what they're saying is that it, it isn't defined, so it becomes a kind of a, a circular argument, which is, well, we have to uh, keep all these troops there, Iraq, Afghanistan, and every country in the world in order because to uh, stave off threats. What threats? 
uh, well, again, well, well we just they, they, these are the threats that will be manifest themselves once the United States withdraws. So it becomes a perfectly circular argument. We have to maintain troops because if we don't have troops, then we'll have threats. <laughs> well, as you say, you maintain troops there and you have destabilization. Who exactly in Iraq wants the United States there? They were already had to withdraw once because the Iraqis wanted America out. Then Obama brought them back. Uh, then already now voted in the Iraqi parliament that, um, that America should withdraw. America refuses to withdraw. And you know we've seen the same thing in Afghanistan. They, they want them out. The, the, the Taliban, which, which has a lot of support in the country, they want Americans gone. So the way this article goes is, oh, well, we're there to help our friends. Well, they don't want you there. <laughs> Just like, you know, you know they, oh. these partners, they don't, they're not interested in this. But Mattis completely, I mean, he was in the Trump administration, but he completely misunderstands what America First is all about. And essentially, if you just boil it down to, don't get into conflicts where we have no business, uh, get out of conflicts where we have no business, and okay, fine, um, you know, step up for the arms industry because they generate revenue, but basically for shareholders, okay? I mean, that's that trans transactional view that Trump has. Um, and I can quibble with it that I have problems with it, but it's very simple is it, why do we need to be everywhere all the time? Why? It, it's actually a threat to the United States and these alliances, um, you know, you, you keep wanting to expand it. Let's look at NATO here, pull in um, uh, Ukraine. Well, Ukraine is in a very, um, uh, it, it has an internal, um, a conflict in the Donbass and where uh, a conflict could arise with Russia because Russia has made it very clear that the Donbass won't fall. Why? Because Russia will not allow that region to be ethnically cleansed. And considering the, the type of personalities that are in Kiev that are supported by the United States and its allies, that is a possibility. Well, I think okay. I said, and I think- How about, how about, how about Georgia? How about, hang right. on, well, what think, about okay, Georgia? Sure. Well, no, yeah. I think that's, you're, you're, all right, go ahead, finish. Okay, Ab Abkhazia and South Ossetia, which Georgia continues to be claimed to be part of its territory. The, the people in both those territories say differently and Russia recognizes uh, differently than the Georgian government. So you wanna bring in a country against your own rules because you can't become a member of NATO if you have conflicts, border disputes with your neighbors. It is in their charter. Yes. So you're going to break your own rules. Right. And then let's say you do break your own rules. Right. Then you're creating security threats. That's 3,000 miles away. Why are you doing that? See, well, I think that's General right. Matt doesn't yeah. address well, that's, that. That's exactly right. And I think that's why, you know, NATO, um, through its reckless promise in, in 2008, its reckless promise uh, to Georgia, that it envisaged uh, Georgia uh, as an, uh, eventually as a member of NATO. It provoked the conflict there because Saakashvili knew that there's a particular conditionality that's attached to becoming a NATO member. There can't be any internal uh, disputes, any kind of uh, secessionist uh, independence movements in your country. So he decided he was going to bring this to an end and therefore brought, uh, you know, provoked this conflict uh, in South Ossetia which ended in a disaster for Georgia because now Georgia has lost uh, South Ossetia, it's lost Abkhazia. And the same thing applied in the case of Ukraine. That agreement, the famous um, EU association agreement that, that everybody was uh, gung-ho for in, in the West, well, entailed essentially Ukraine becoming a de facto member of NATO. Well, a, a very sizable chunk of the country wasn't going to accept that. There was just no way that they were gonna accept that. And that's, and, and that's why Yanukovych had to actually step back from that agreement. He knew that the country wouldn't accept it. So again, the, the, the NATO's expansion has led to absolute disasters for uh, other countries. And NATO hasn't learned itself. It still wants to do that. It wants to go on into Kazakhstan. Can you imagine the, the, the disaster that that would entail uh, particularly as you're moving towards China, as if China is going to accept, you know, NATO on its borders, uh, let, let alone Russia. And yet, it, it, with people like Mattis, you know, it just, they just continue with this. Oh, yeah, yeah, we got to, we got to yeah, keep see, doing this. Well, however, however disastrous this is. See, what, what the, the what's really at the is um, implied in this article and in the thinking of, of Mattis and people like him is that 
American hegemony is a norm. It's not, okay? And that's what's causing these conflicts here. The, uh, Russia was not mentioned in the article once. I've read it twice, okay? The country that was focused in on was China, okay? Um, and, and it was kind of um, um, uh, um, weasel words all the way through. I don't know if what, you, what you thought about it, but I'm it was sorry. a I, I, I have I have relationship with China and all this. But then, you know, we got to have a lot of hardware over there. I mean, to deter them. I, I thought it was this kind of weasel words through it. Yeah, um, but the, with, you know, these partnerships and relationships and alliances, this is, this is where the world has to worry about. For example, look at... You know, what, why should the United States get involved in a territorial dispute between the Philippines and China and Vietnam and China? What, why should the United States be there? And what you end up having is what we call, you know, wag the dog. You know, it's these smaller uh, alliance members that can actually force the hand of the senior member of the alliance where there is no national security at risk at, at, in play. Okay, and this is what's very dangerous here, because what it does is it, it puts, you know, a lot of people don't understand the origins of the First World War, and I'll just be very short here, prestige, international prestige, not looking weak. Is the United States going to find itself in the same position if it has two, two countries, one or two countries, um, uh, simultaneously uh, making claims against China? Is that a reason to go to war with China? Really? Are no, you serious? Uh, not, not at all. And I think that goes back to the question that they never define what an American national interest is, what security threats uh, does the United States face. Trump, to his credit, when he ran, he actually specified, he said it's about the deindustrialization and the e economic impoverishment of the United States, uh, which has been facilitated by China. Now, you can disagree with that analysis, but nonetheless, he said there's a real problem of our manufacturing industry uh, being shipped off to China. And as you say, this article doesn't even address that, because if China is an adversary, and they call it an adversary, then they don't explain in what way is it an adversary? I mean, it's, a, it's an economic giant. And if it's an economic giant, how are you going to deal with it? What policies are you going to enact in order to deal with an economic rival? There's nothing there. And so again, they talk talking about, oh, China is a military threat or whatever, but that's not, China, China, you know, it's like the Cold War thinking that China is not a military threat. It's, it's, uh, it's an economic problem. And they have no idea what they're going to do with it. You know, actually, Mattis does say that indirectly, is that we don't have, a mil the military is not the tool to, to deal with this. But he kind of just leaves it open right there. But what is really interesting to me is, um, I, he says it at least once, maybe twice, about making sure the United States remains relevant in the world. I thought that was really interesting. You know, and that's like a phobia in the back of their minds. Because, you know, when, when we look at, you know, during Trump's trade wars directed against China, you know, and the, 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 the big word everyone was, was bantering about, it was decoupling. And, and so the United States decoupling from China. And an argument can be made for that, and it's probably inevitable in many ways. Um, but that's for a future video. But one, an issue that wasn't addressed at the same time is that countries like Vietnam and the Philippines, because of the bellicose um, uh, 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 language, they, will, they, they decided to start decoupling from the U.S. and to couple more with China, okay? And so this is what bothers people like Mattis, because, because the United States has experienced deindustrialization on such a rapid pace, and I, I don't see it coming back. Uh, you can make arguments one way or another what happened under Trump. I hear strong arguments on both sides. Um, I hear strong arguments on both sides about uh, the trade imbalance. Nonetheless, Trump, in, in theory, is absolutely right, okay? Did he have the right policies to deal with it? We can talk about that later. But what's happening here is that because the United States uses the dollar as a political weapon, devalues the currency by doing that, you sh it should be a fiat um, currency where it is not politicized. That's why people trust it. The more you politicize it, the more people say, ah, we'll go into different currencies. Maybe we'll start trading in our own currencies. And that is one of the most, most important phenomena that's been going on in the last 10 years is that China and Russia, they, they trade and they're in, they're 
currencies, not with the dollar. And more and more countries are doing that because they want to avoid sanctions from the US Treasury. And it's the America, America's fault for doing that to their currency. Right, and that's clearly what happened uh, in, in the case of uh, Iran. And when every time the United States applies these sanctions, uh, they use the dollar and they say, well, you know, hey, you can't sell your oil because the oil trade is denominated in the dollar. So therefore, Iran has to find some way around it. And of course, other countries and they think, well, I, I, we need to find some way around it because we don't want to be in the position of being subjected to U.S. sanctions and suddenly, you know, we can't make a living. Uh, so that's absolutely right. It's the United States that has devalued uh, the dollar by using it in, in this uh, very cruel uh, way. Um, but the interesting thing again is goes back to the uh, what the security threats. Now, they talk about these uh, global alliances and partnerships and you know keep American troops uh, everywhere. Now, you know, if you're in Europe, what are you worried about? You are worried about a massive flow of migrants that they, you know, a, a, you know, a return of the days of 2015 or even worse. The people like Mattis, they want to continue with these wars in the Middle East absolutely guaranteed to create instability and the massive flow of migrants. Meanwhile, there is this guy um, in Turkey, um, Erdogan, who is basically holding these, <laughs> these um, migrants basically as a kind of trigger that he can uh, deploy against Europe. Those are the real security threats uh, facing uh, Europe, just as uh, there's a, you know, the, the problem with the American uh, border, which now that they know that the Biden administration is coming, uh, they'll become massive and promising also an amnesty. There's already a massive flow of migrants to the border. I said, great, you know, you know, we want a piece of this uh, amnesty. So those are the threats, not the sort of this, this fantasy world that they, they create. Oh, well, you know, going to be in, in this. Iraq and Afghanistan. I mean, it's... You're, 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 just, you're absolutely right. They, they're dealing with an imaginary world, an, an imaginary world where they feel comfortable and they have confidence. You know, mi militarizing space. Well, and he talks about the, the need for diplomacy. Well, why don't we just have some diplomacy and outlaw militarizing space for everyone? Right. But you know, but no, no, there's too much money to be made there. Okay, no, exactly I mean, right. yeah. I keep stressing it in our videos here is that people like Mattis, they live in the unipolar moment, and that is an illusion right now. And 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 this and this was good. You know, we did a video like Tony Blaken and coming on. All these people here, they all believe in this all the same old nonsense here. They believe in a world that simply doesn't exist anymore. And, and that is very dangerous here. And it doesn't address national security issues in the United States. And, uh, and like I said in our past video, there should be America first, there should be Russia first, there should be China first, India first, okay? And then, and, and, and it should be done more equitably. I think, you know, he's, every time the authors in Mattis use the word sovereignty, I, have, I, I wonder if they have a dictionary. Can you look it up and see what it really means? Right, right. Yeah, no, that, that's exactly right, because these, um, alliances and partnerships uh, go against the, the country's national interest. They don't, they don't want this. Uh, now, you know, take a look at, uh, for instance, now Hungary, which is a member of uh, NATO, is clearly dreading uh, the arrival of the uh, uh, Biden team, and particularly um, Blinken, um, who clearly uh, has, a, has a thing, has a real animus towards um, Orban. Um, so here is it, and they, they are really going to make life difficult for Hungary. So you're, you're in this partnership with, uh, with a partner who's out to screw you. Now, that's not, that's not about, you know, well, creating they, friends and influencing, <laughs> you know. Why should the United States have a beef with Hungary? Exactly. Why should it? Absolutely right. right. No, no reason whatsoever. You know, Hungarians deal with their own problems. America should deal with their own problems. But somehow it's an obsession uh, that, you know, what Hungary does in its own, within its own borders, is an, uh, an obsession in the United States. And oh. it's been like this as well. You know, you know, it used to be, you know, what Serbia does within its own borders, what Russia does within its own borders, is an American obsession. And an, yeah. an obsession of the kind of policymaking elite that is really, you know, 
uh, salivating about being back in power with uh, Biden. You know, another uh, ter um, term, a phrase that was used that really gets my blood boy boiling, and you know it is, it's the uh, rules-based order, right, right, okay? Right, yeah. Another euphemistic nonsense, batshit crazy idea, okay? You know, rules-based order, you know what that, that's a code word, it's very clear. It means we don't need international law, okay? Or at least we right. don't, okay? Maybe if the rest of you who want to, we're gonna go with a rules-based order and you can have international law, okay? But we, uh, we, our cards always trump yours. And that is the arrogance of this fluffy, innocuous right. <laughs> puff piece, okay? And right. from a, what's, what used to be a, a, a serious journal, now it's another, it's another um, uh, left-leaning, um, uh, um, virtue signaling uh, news outlet. Right. No, I think that's right. The rules-based order means we set the rules that you have to abide by, but we don't actually abide by those rules uh, ourselves. So when we support an independence movement here, then that's entirely uh, acceptable. When we, when we want to crush an independence movement, then that's uh, in accordance with uh, rules. We just set them uh, in, a, in a completely haphazard, arbitrary manner, whatever serves our interest. Uh, and, yeah. as you, and you're right to say, you know, it's a nice sounding phrase. Well, rule -based, that, that sounds good, rules-based order. But exactly, it, it's to prevent saying international law, because otherwise you're gonna say, well, how was um, invading Iraq in accordance with international law. Um, they, uh, you know, the bombing of Libya, how did, how did that have anything to do with that? You don't want to raise any of those questions. So. Well, you know, you, know what they, you know what the left always says? The left is really weak on foreign policy. I don't know why. Um, uh, the left always says, well, George, it's complicated. Yeah. And my reaction, this happened to my on cross I said, no, it's not complicated. It's wrong. Right, right. No, no absolutely. Well, um, uh, the sad thing is, the sad conclusion is that these people uh, will be in power. Um, come Just come one, more, one more thought. One more thought before we go here. There was a reference to the Lafayette Square uh, incident yes, where sir. Trump uh, crossed the street with military brass with him. Um, and oddly enough, in this article, there was a criticism of Trump of uh, politicizing the military. Well, Jim Mattis, you in this article and your other loser friends that wrote it, you're meddling in domestic politics by writing it, okay? Yeah. Again, no self-reflection from these people, right. okay? Right. Generals, when you've done your service, you get your pension and move along, okay? You know, write a book, you know, teach the long, young lads and ladies, okay? But, you know, don't, don't diminish your position. And that's exactly what he's done. Okay. Yeah, Shame, yeah, that's, shameful, that's, shameful behavior. That's, but, no, that, that, that's exactly right. And of course, uh, uh, Trump uh, didn't uh, you know, use, use the military any political purpose. I mean, he was he was there, um, it, and it was an important gesture for him to show that you know he wasn't cowering in the uh, White House. Uh, he was uh, not afraid to step outside of the White House and not afraid of crowds in Lafayette Square. So, um, and again. You know, he, he was only ready to use the National Guard when it looked like, you know, mayors and governors were just letting uh, rampaging mobs rule the streets. I mean, you know, he essentially said, okay, it's up to you to bring order. If you refuse to do so, then, you know, we would have to bring in other uh, forces. So, um, yeah. Anyway, thank you very much, Peter. And as always, we will be maintaining our laser like focus on. Uh, the foreign policy doings of the people uh, likely to be in power soon. Uh, so uh, if you like the gaggle, please like, share, and subscribe. See you soon. Bye.